Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 304 with me, your host, Agostino Zinga, as episode number 304. Now, before we start the show, some bit of housekeeping. If you want to follow me on social media, please do on twitter.com forward slash Agostino Zinga. That's Agostino Zinga, all one word, on twitter.com forward slash Agostino Zinga. Follow me on Instagram too, same handle, instagram.com forward slash Agostino Zinga, all one word, Agostino Zinga, all one word. Now, that's out of the way. If it's your first time watching the show, of course, smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, actually, please share this show, give it five star reviews, people can find it and discover it just like like you have now on we go so here we are another day has got to us and i'm hopefully i'm hoping i'm finding in good spirits hoping that you're in a good place hoping that you're just you know dealing with things as it comes along your way as i am myself um and yeah um it's been it's been it's been interesting isn't it right i think uh, i've done that thing now where i'm specifically checking the news like you know sometime in the afternoon once a day and then trying to go about the rest of my day there's not really much to update you after that um i've been checking sometimes the donald trump press conferences because they're hilarious the way he's kind of going at the press and the way the press are going back at him it's just turned into this really weird i think some polit- some people who have followed politics closer than i am would have probably hoped that this crisis would have brought the best out of trump right he would have been acting quote unquote presidential but if anything it's basically showing you that he just double triples down quadruples down and everything um he doesn't like normally if i think now the common thing i find you've got to follow this guy on twitter i don't know what he does i think he just sits in front of his tv recording every trump appearance that he does but every press conference this guy called um aaron rupta i'll check i'll, I'll show you actually let me see if i can find here on my thing it's aaron that's it Aaron Rupa, I'm going to say he probably works on Vox or something, or I assume one of those kind of left-leading places because he does not a fan of the old uh, Donald at all. So this guy, you should follow him on Instagram. I'm oh, sorry, on Twitter, sorry. He's called, his handle is um, A-T-R-U-P-A-R. So A-T-R-U-P-A-R, Aaron Rupa. And he is a journalist at Vox.com, it seems like. But he essentially does this, which I'm showing on screen. He's got all the press briefings that trump does from the white house he essentially gets all the screen grabs super high res i'm not sure if he's got something hooked up his computer or he's watching them live on the live stream probably but he's always sitting on there you know clipping up little interesting questions and quibits and all that stuff and um it's just interesting to see how um combative trump is during this whole thing you know instead of it being a time to galvanize the country even even if because i think some people were saying that most of the reason why he's so combative is because he's worried that this crisis is going to lead to him is going to damage his re-election uh, bid right for next term which is understandable i guess in some respects I, I know we'd want our world leaders to be a little bit more altruistic to be a little bit more um selfless but really and truly man or woman if you decide to enter a presidential race you're pretty sociopathic right you have a pretty large ego in it right um uh you're quite self-centered in some regards if you think you should be the leader of the free world especially right or you should be a leader of any sort of nation state right you, you there's obviously something in your brain wiring that means that you know you're not your average everyday folk so if you competitive in press conferences if you have these weird little personal personality ticks and stuff and i don't know i i should come to expect it it's sort of like you know our greatest creatives our most fantastic artists people who kind of you know um leave audiences in awe they're the ones that i should be left to be weirdos isn't it you don't want to iron them out and turn them into like you know boring liverpool street wankers out on the night out on the thursday isn't it you want them to be as weird as possible so the fact that trump attacks his opponents i don't really mind it but you just would have thought in this time of need when things are going really crazy and you've got this invisible invisible enemy i think he calls it right <laughs> that he's at war with you'd have thought he would have tried to be a world time president you know do aside with all the partisan bullshit and just you know government as a country and if and if anything that could have maybe helped him that could have maybe helped to sway some because the thing with he the thing that he's probably just worried about is that his base what is always going to back him in it right it's like whoever's your fan is going to be going to be a fan i guess his worry is that because i think from reading in between lines and just re- repeating what i heard other people say he supposedly didn't win the popular vote in the states in it when he was facing against hillary hillary uh won the popular vote as in you know just from the population um, she got more votes in her favor but then you're meant to also get votes within the what is that i think is it the con- congress or whatever 
people that sit in those seats that are all white and old and wrinkly. You've been to get votes for them too, right? And I don't know what it is because I'm not a politics dude, but if that's the case, looking at it from the outside in, he might be worried that because he lost a popular vote the first time around and because this is happening, it might affect his overall popularity with the nation of rule because, you know, it means that the majority of people didn't want him in, but he was able to finagle the system and get himself in the seat. Cool, he did it. He smashed it. But then if this is happening, people are already trying to blame him for it, which you can't really. And I think even if you're an ardent anti-Trumper, right, orange man bad, you can't really say it's his fault. I think everyone's dealt with it pretty poorly, uh, apart from maybe two or three countries. It's not been a, you know, no one's got, no one so far has got an A star really, right? Everyone's kind of, even the good ones are probably at best got like a C plus, right? Or a lower B. No one's really done that well. So the fact that he's had some missteps here and there, he shouldn't be chastised for it. And again, you can't blame him directly for this virus coming to this or going to the States, whatever it may be. But yeah, it's just funny to just to see how combative some of these little press junkets are, man. I'll show one of them. Actually, let me see if I can get one up here. It's just kind of one clip. It's just always, you know, there's some of the stuff that's been asked. What is this? Ask about hair salon. What does it say here? Can you weigh in on this? Because nail salon so the caption is ox how it's possible for hair salons and tattoo parlors in georgia to reopen burke says if there's a way that people can social distance and do these things then they can do these things i don't know how tattoo parlors yeah. dr burks can you weigh in on this because the people of atlanta want to hear from you as well as much as they want to hear from their governor and from you yeah Mr. i President. think i think it's fine what, what about how do you safely have hair salons and nail salons and tattoo parlors where people where where apparently is where is this that? is in georgia where, where people have to inherently be close together. I think what I've been trying to communicate over the last several days is it's really important that the governors and mayors communicate critical information to their communities and show very clearly the data. We remember we wanted this data and evidence based, the data that they okay, use. This is not about it, this is more so about it. Let me see one more they're arguing. Yeah, this is the one. This. Some critics are saying that you are using the virus now in this crisis to follow through on that promise to reduce no, legal immigration. No, no. Well, I want people that are in this country, I want our citizens to get jobs. I don't want them to have competition. We have a very unusual situation where something came in that nobody has seen for many, many decades. Probably 1917 would be the closest analogy if you look at it, when you look at the contagion, the kind of contagion we're talking about. So, no, I'm not I'm not doing that at all. I want... I, I, I can't want, find a good one, but there's good ones where you just being a little bit more argumentative. See if I can get one. Da, 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 stop market, Trump lines. Da, 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 that's about Kim Jong condition. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You check it out yourself and find it, but it's pretty funny. Um, he tweets, he does all this stuff on there, you know, puts it out on there, and you can check and see if you are orange man bad, yeah or nay. Let's move on. I'm going to quickly go through. Oh, actually, there's a quick few bits on here that I thought were of interest. Let me see if I can find it. Where's the whole plan? Just to get some coronavirus stuff out of the way in the beginning. So there's a sick plan that I've actually stumbled upon, which is um, from Harvard. Let me see if I can get it up on you. Harvard. Do, do, do. Reopening. So actually, I might have it here. Bear with me one sec. I should have probably linked this properly so it would have done it easily. But yep, yeah, so this is it. So it's a roadmap roadmap for pandemic rollout, right? I'm pretty interested about this because I think as a lot of us have kind of gleaned from what's happening, it's gonna be you know it's gonna be a long time before things get back to normal how they were prior to this whole pandemic. But I'm interested to see how different countries, different governments decide to get people back into the workplace and also live in everyday lives and it just how does it happen and also the changes that are going to happen that are going to you know there are going to be some everlasting changes that are going to affect us you know for um, for decades uh but just the in because usually you see it that you know it's close it's easy to shut something down than it is to restart something for the most part right anyone that's front of a house party where police officers have shut it down and you try to restart it again you always lose a couple of people here and there the vibe kind of dies out and it's never really the same because everyone's kind of worried it's going to get closed and it same would apply for a country being shut down b- the pandemic so there's interesting approaches that they're doing um there's this paper i recently saw from harvard um that's essentially a roadmap that kind of details a plan that they're trying to go with and there was one bit that I thought here that was really interesting. I'm try to get up for you guys. Check this. Da, 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 da. Copy. So this is the uh, this is this plan that I found. It's like a roadmap for pandemic resilience. 
um, that kind of essentially gives us a, an idea on what we can expect or how we can expect things to go back to normal. So if you're just listening to this, you've got phase one, two, three, and four, which essentially one is where we're at now in May. And then it goes to four where we are basically all back up and running, doing what the things that we love best around August. So my initial um, estimation of it being September kind of is laid true to bear. But my overall skeptical kind of analysis was that we'll probably get back to normal next year, like spring. Because the way I thought about it was that, you know, there'll be a couple of industries that will take time to pick back up again. There won't be the same amount of people supporting those businesses in the first place. Because someone will be, you know, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that are stuck at home now that'll be like, you know, as soon as this thing is over, I'm going to go to my local restaurant. I'm going to support them. I'm going to eat out every every night with my friends and family and reconnect so I can give those guys money and tip them well. Blah, blah, blah. All these, you know, really cool things. But there's going to be a few people also who are kind of a little bit hesitant about heading out. They're going to be a little bit worried. Um, they're going to maybe tell their friends they're worried, tell their f- family members that they're worried, and they have you know some sort of trepidation behind putting themselves in that kind of environment or that, or putting themselves in a place of risk. So they're going to take some time to get reintegrated back into society in the usual way they were before. And it's just going to be some people who are just going to lose flat out, right? There'll be some people who are going to move away, who are going to decide to you know, uh, what you're going to strip down on the e- extracurricular activities and just get back to the you know bare minimum, live a quote unquote minimalist lifestyle. That's going to impact us. So I would say, personally, just from a, you know, um, if everything doesn't go as we please, as we want it to go, and if you know th- there's a second peak, and you know so somehow God forbid another epidemic comes out of nowhere, I would say for it to get back to what you remember as normal, quote unquote, definitely next year's spring, you would see uh, probably less people out and about wearing face masks. Whereas here, between now and the end of the year, you're gonna see everybody afraid to touch everybody. No one's staying next to each other in shops. People are fighting because someone's too, too close to them. People wearing face masks, people wearing gloves, people spraying the air with fucking, you know, air freshener and shit and antibacterial spray. There's gonna be some madness is happening between now and the end of the year. Don't be surprised to see it, but I think by spring, people would have chilled out. They've got it out of the them and people then will be a little bit more relaxed but i thought the plan was um pretty interesting about what it says in terms of businesses so you've got phase one you've got stabilized essential sectors um at one point you maintain social distancing you test trace and provide um supported isolation and then you retrain people to replace COVID essential workers and experiment with testing then phase two you've got expand essential workers expand essential workers to include short medium and long-term needs address continued shortages in the social se- sector and modify social distancing to expand uh, essential workers which is going to be difficult because of course you're not including the month of june there i think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be tempted by the weather cause especially in london you know london is known for having pretty shitty weather and it's always raining and whatever it may be but it's been really beautiful these last couple of days and it's already you know testing people's patience so that month in the middle that i haven't mentioned here that june is going to be the one where it's going to be really crucial that people kind of knuckle down and band together because already you know we're just you know approaching the last week of april coming up now and people are already suffering they're already getting tempted to go out so i can't see this holding <laughs> um holding on any i can't see this kind of this thought being able to be maintained uh with may and june still come up coming up let alone july and then you head into phase three it says in collective stay at home so that will be when everybody will be allowed to quote unquote go out but it won't mean the businesses will be back because that's one thing i was curious about before i was like oh if they just open the floodgates again or if they just start streaming that's why i wasn't sure that they would put live events back on again before august which is i think the date the fa are telling all the i think the fa was at europe or something maybe on europe uh, yeah the european the uefa might be telling the prem the football leagues around the world that they want to restart their competition in august so that means the uh, premier league season has to be done before then right to sort out the places for next year or whatever um but I don't think that's going to happen. We already have news already now that Netherlands, um, the Dutch league, the Eredivisie, have supposedly um, postponed the entire season. They can read it off as null and void because they won't be able to start it up in, uh, before September. So it was my, it was kind of my um, hesitance or my kind of suspicion was that I wasn't very, I wasn't sure they would be able to put on live events, especially stream them uh, on TV or whatever. Or have you know? I remember some. German chairman saying that they were going to have uh, screens all up around the outside of the stadium and have cars parked in a car so you can watch it. 
you know like those old school cinemas in America where you sort of like drive in a, in a car park and shit and watch them in out loud uh, in public or maybe in an open air sort of event but I thought that would just encourage people to kind of break out and you know, not obey social distancing measures but if they can do it in tandem or if they can do the um, kind of reducing the kind of sh- no if they can take off the shackles and say hey you guys can come out your houses before the season starts it makes things a little bit easier you don't get people getting tempted to run out before the uh, restrictions are lifted but again who else who is going to be out because you know i don't know you have to be i'm not sure how desperate i am for a drink to go out to a busy bar straight away you know there might be a period of like isolation for yourself just to like make sure that you're okay to kind of get make sure the you know the few dregs are it's like those is it ants is it killer ants or is it rats in new york i remember hearing that they're so sophisticated now or that you know from exposure to so you know i guess if you're exposed to sophisticated traps or poisoning systems you end up getting a bit more smarter so the rats in the new york subway have developed a way of somehow sending their more weaker brethren and sisters out in front to test if the food that's laid out isn't covered in poison or whatever maybe um so that would happen in <laughs> in i would assume for us too as a humankind right there'll be people who'll be like you know what let me let the dregs go out let me let all the over excited people go out first let people you know let like a whole suit for people catch it again and then what and now kind of come out once everything is sorted or there's some people are just like you know what i'm not coming out until a vaccine is around so that's one so that's july looks like late july here yeah? so um and stay at home so it's like mobilize another 10 percent of workers in the central sector recruit community organizers and social service agencies to support communities in need temporary relax regulations allow necessary modifications late july then four you've got the full pandemic resilience return 20 percent at home workers at off offices reopen schools so that's kind of like when everything kind of picks up again um which is in kind of august time and again this is only dependent on you know the peak not being as harsh as it as they're forecasting you know some other crazy thing that we haven't kind of factored in coming into play but that kind of lays it out quite well and i think for anyone that's involved in the creative music scene i think this explains why stuff like you know junction 2 and all that sort of stuff had to be cancelled because they could have probably got away with pushing it back to august but they still have to you know get the equipment um get the people in that need to work on it you know all that sort of stuff get the licenses done before the august day anyway so with everything being shut down and people working in their capacity just make it too difficult that's why a lot of people are postponing because i'm sure a lot of them were under the assumption that you could potentially do an event in september october but there's no guarantee you're going to have people come into it anyway that's the thing you have to kind of keep in mind just because something's open especially you know i don't know so um that gives me the idea that again i think there's going to be a need for a lot of underground and DIY promoters to put on you know sort of open air illegal parties just to kind of fill that void for the time being for the people that don't mind doing it and then the quintessential you know standard clubs where you have to pay an entry and the security and there's bars and stuff and there's toilets they'll have to wait until uh, the latest September to get going in that regard and then I'm assuming there'll be some I don't know psycho DJs that are able to tour towards the end of July still and kind of do their first t- couple of shows I'm assuming depending on where they go in the world there might be a lot more relaxed laws and i don't know some parts of southeast asia that might want to yeah that might be a new thing too you might see you might see a big you remember when all the middle east countries i'm gonna say middle east countries was it sometime last year they did some festival that peggy dj that peggy grew and everyone was getting angry at her because you know supposedly these guys don't have the best um human rights uh record in the world and she took that payday right you remember all that stuff so i'd imagine there'll be a lot of southeast asian or festival organizers party promoters putting on events in the hopes of uh in the hopes of helping to repair the image of asia worldwide in it because you know as much as some you know western based european based um, asian people are upset about it unfortunately you know the narrative that we have going on at the moment now is that you know this virus stemmed or you know sprung up from china because you guys eat bats and shit so because of that there's going to have to be a constrained effort from you know of course people that live in the western side of it the western side of the hemisphere uh, with other major descent to educate people let them know what's really happening i don't know present different uh, point of view maybe let them know that you're not from china you're from south korea or some shit there's gonna be a need to do all that and then there's gonna be a need from the state from the countryside too to make sure that they have those people coming in because i'd imagine a place like bali you know a place like vietnam a place like singapore a place like thailand 
uh, China even to a certain extent you know they rely quite heavily on you know that tourism money coming in year in year out so you can't have that drab all of a sudden especially if people then decide to take away your manufacturing because that's a conversation two people are having isn't it right that we're too interconnected we need uh, to pull away and have manufacturing return to you know our own countries which is something that i'm probably i'm sure won't probably end up happening because they'll end up noticing how much it actually costs to produce stuff here and be like you know what fuck that it's just it to delhi and wherever else but yeah that's that news um let's move on whilst i saw that i thought was interesting this was really cute um da, 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 da. what was this video let me get up on here this little kid realizes his dad is driving a train i just saw it round up on my on my youtube recommend this i thought i'd um put it up for you guys to check out Look at that place. At that age, trains were the best, isn't it? You got so much pleasure out of the tiniest things in life. That's super cool. Um, that was one and of course there's on the flip side there's a video of Philip Seymour Hoffman falling off of a, ch of a car doing an advert for hey. a mattress company you hear you hear a lot about these sort of things from um, especially LA based comedians who are you know I think especially pre-podcasting days where they sort of had to make a name for themselves in order to get more comedy gear, which is always a weird thing how those entertainment industry stuff works isn't it I understand, you know, wanting to be a star and wanting to get your name about there, but how did those guys manage to convince comedians that the best way to become, to get more gigs, to get more people to laugh at your jokes, to get more people to buy your tickets, was to, like, do stuff that had nothing to do with jokes, right? Whether it's commercials or, you know, being an extra in a movie or doing, you know, voiceover work, stuff that had nothing to do with the art being funny. They somehow convinced them that, that was a great lane to parlay into your other stuff. It's just nonsense. Whereas now they have oven, you know, maybe it's just a process of like not having able to. I think stuff like the smartphone did a lot in it because the fact that you can just record yourself doing your act or fucking around on Vine or TikTok, whatever it may be, helps to people, helps to get your word out that you're funny, that you've got something about you. I think back in the day, you didn't have a means to do that, right? Camcorders back in the day were like, what, five grand or some shit. Um, but yeah they managed to do that so the whole and then the other thing too I think commercials also had a, there was a lot of money attached to them too in it pre social media the only way to kind of get your stuff out there was to have TV loads of these TV adverts TV ad, or TV ad spots um, you know sometimes you know the better the prime time the more premium that you'd pay but you know sometimes you could stumble upon a viral hit that would you know resonate across the country get some free press blah 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 and sell the shit ton of vacuums or whatever you're selling and usually it was come it was kind of you know really nondescript places that had the best budgets right because you know they were making money hand over fist so i guess his mattress company he reached out to philip seymour hoffman and decided it was a good idea to get him to number one play a guitar which i didn't know he was a guitar player in the first place um on top of some cars or a roof and then jump on top of a mattress that's parked on the roof it's just so funny let me get up on here if you guys can see can you see that yeah hey this is dean trumbull for the mattress man as queen mat a three a three okay. Hey, this is Dean Trumbull for the Mattress Man. Give me a call at 3700466. For limited time only, D&D &D Mattress has Queen Mattress sets for $99 and King set for $129. <laughs> he bounces on it and he bounces on the floor. <laughs> Just fucking insane. It helps because, you know, rumor has it that he was, you know, he liked the white stuff and you know, he liked to have, have a good time. So he might not have felt it, but hearing that crash as he kind of falls on the floor, I think he felt that all the way. 29. Like, I know it's part of it is the guitar, but that is definitely some bones in there. Shit. But how did they think that was going to end? Did they, do you think they did a run through of that? Do you think there was a rehearsal? Like, how else did they think it was going to end? He would have had to, what, jump closest to the inside as possible so that when he jumped again, he landed on the edge he could balance himself. What was he meant to do? Was he meant to just jump on it and then what? 
smile like what was the end of this uh treatment and the guy says shit runs over what happens at the end <laughs> you get some ginger oh, uh, oh yeah shit man are you okay yeah uh, i was afraid it was gonna happen uh, i was afraid it was gonna happen with that goddamn thing jesus all right? are you okay no i'm fine did you try your arm and stuff you are all right you're okay? wearing leather What's okay. up, guitar, okay. Dude, uh, you get it on film yeah, yeah we got it yeah. <laughs> or maybe it's fake i don't know Jesus Christ, that is insane. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? Anything for the old exposure. Let's move on here. We have Stephanie Freeman on TikTok. Do I give a shit about this really? Not particularly. Um, weird challenge thing with this girl called Stephanie Freeman who decided to make it into some sort of opportunity to attack the black race which i'm very angry about which i don't really actually give a shit about to be honest but um yeah it's a challenge of some sorts i'm assuming right where they what let's see this i haven't actually watched this myself let's see what they're saying hey today we're making okay Niggers. Wow. First we have. Yeah, she said it. Okay, so they've got... <laughs> I'm just going to leave it. I'll put the camera on the words. So it just hovers above it. So there's two girls. There's just not two girls. This couple. They're in a bathroom. And there's this challenge where they... I think you pretend to make something, right? So like taking the piss out of those instructional cooking videos where you sort of like... The hand comes into into frame, pour something in, pour something in. So they start off with the actual dish, what they want. It's a bit of paper with the N word written in it, as you heard the guy say. And then they pour... The, in, the ingredients in cup to cup on top of it which different things in it so this is play <laughs> first we have black, black. yeah, yeah, yeah. Black. yeah. Down there. next we have don't, don't have a dad don't have a dad yeah okay. yeah and then we have eat watermelon and fried chicken Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> next one is uh make good choices let's um, see oh Oh, there's, oh, there, there's nothing oh, there. Jesus Next Christ. we have rob people. Specifically whites, yeah. Imagine imagine how being that age and having these kind of views that like boiling inside of you and then also having the guts and the gumption to start doing those dances on TikTok that are obviously inspired by black popular popular black music or whatever it may be. Um it's just wild, isn't it? Like imagine like but of course it must come from somewhere right parents are probably you know unhinged as well there's probably a lot of uh you know I, I i'd assume the jews don't do don't fare too well in that household either right i think everyone gets it in there right whether it's asian jewish black people whatever you all get it in that household but god almighty they do that last one is go to jail um wow Okay, so I guess that's the video. So what does she say? She's a senior that attends Carol. So again, the internet did what it does best. You know, I think when it comes to cancelling, I'm not really a fan. But I understand when moments like this when people start tagging her school and you know she goes to Carl. Was it Carrollton High School? Blah 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 blah. And it's in Georgia too, which has a very big population of black people. Wow. Okay, it doesn't matter. And so anyway, I, I don't. Really, I'm not really for the whole cancelling thing. I'm not a fan of it. I think people should be allowed there. Um, should be allowed to redeem themselves everyone makes mistakes but and i do realize that there's some things that when they occur they're just so egregious that you're allowed to have a you're allowed to have an emotional reaction to it now i wouldn't necessarily do it myself i am not going to be the one to like call up a school and tell someone to get rid but i understand the people that feel the need to do it it's like their civic duty right to go ahead and tag the school contact the dean contact the admission person and get that person written off right there actively looking towards to do that so here's someone like that could you know, at a, a TV production company or something, you know, I get it. Um, but yeah, what a mistake to make, especially now when everyone's at home and got time on their hands, everyone's on social media, everyone's gonna see this, right? I think prior, she probably could have got away with it because it might have come during the week of, you know, some rapper getting beaten up in an award ceremony, some, you know, person in Hollywood getting caught sleeping with somebody else. Like, something could have happened in the news week that could have, you know, masked this kind of you know random college girl deciding to go on a you know racist video uh, making rant with her boyfriend in some small cupboard of a toilet 
that would have got, got set under the rug but because everyone's at home everyone's got access to their phones what's the first thing they're going to do they're going to be like you know what I can make good use of my time right I can get one over on the white man that's been holding me down and get these fucking you know racist so and so off this platform and it seems to have worked but guessing by what um, the follow up was so that's the video of course and then the follow up was this thing I think she apologised but I think it was too late I think she got you know taken away from her school and shit but some of these screenshots are quite painful to read in terms you can hear the fucking terror in her voice but again you know big deal you have to if you want to do if you want to do that dumb thing as a net you have to also accept the point the consequences so this is um a post that i found from a guy called wilkinson cherry it says lol it's crazy how at steph hashtag stephanie freeman has changed her tone so fast take this as a psa to call racist white people to all racist white people sorry if you're not racist do not apply to you just because 45 is in the office doesn't mean that you he can help you we have no problem ruining your life but she didn't she you didn't actually ruin it that's a funny thing she did it herself in it imagine uploading it onto tiktok as well my people have got their like private snapchat story things leaked online right so what did she why did she think this would suddenly not be a thing i don't know really know but there's this one screenshot we're looking at here where it's got stephanie freeman she says no i'm not sorry what do y'all want me to say the hell and then next person her underneath i think the comment of her tiktoker says at least my dad can play can pay to have his whole thing go away which is more than i can say for you father sneakers oh gee, jesus she's firing hard with the end bombs in it next screenshot here we got Nick. of course the, the the contrast in the flagrancy is always funny it? especially when it comes from people like normal average day people when they actually realize the severity of the issue because i think when you're that young you don't really know what you're doing right she's you know high school i don't know senior whatever she is right she's probably under 21 years of age you're kind of bored at home you've got nothing to do you've got you know you have these racist force anyway i can understand why you f- might think this is funny kind of amongst your group of friends who are also fucking nut bags and scumbags whatever but you don't necessarily realize that you don't necessarily think five steps ahead you don't think about what happens next in it you just think about the action itself which is the height of immaturity but the contrast in these two screenshots is just frightening right you've got this massive paragraph and then you've got these quick on the previous one right you've got these quick little notes and like oh my dad make you go away so the second one of our apologizing says i want to apologize for the important video i posted i know in my heart i'm wrong if it was my boyfriend is racist see so yeah, i straight away throwing your boyfriend under the bus nah mate it's you as well my boyfriend is racist and he slowly normalizes racism on me yeah what what when did racism turn into some kind of <laughs> hypnotizing charm people did to somebody right usually i'd assume if you were dating somebody and they happen to you know drop some hard are n bombs in your presence in a derogatory way or even in a good way right just you know if that person wasn't black and they're saying that kind of thing around you you would probably you know twist your head and be like what right and then you'd make a face you'd have a conversation about it and then you'd slowly but surely realize oh shit this guy's in the kkk and then you would even have to make a decision right do i stay do i go but it's not something that you kind of get convinced about like oh babe what's that why are you saying that word for and it's like don't worry we'll talk about it tomorrow there's not talking about it tomorrow you want to find out what's going on right now in it you could be living with a fucking murderer so this idea that he somehow slowly but surely you know uh what you call it what you call it um hypnotized them into believing these thoughts and you know was somehow you know playing all these images of like aggressive white black people in prisons beating people up and somehow trained her to kind of hate the this other is insane isn't it it really is really really bizarre especially considering that she lives in georgia there's tons of people around her right like I, i don't get how you could suddenly build up these weird closeted um you know shorts lacking in i don't know what it is but let's continue the apology um still i should never have let him i believe blacks are human too oh thanks darling <laughs> made an image of christ that should bring a jesus imagine in one paragraph or in a couple lines she's threw a boyfriend under the bus she's t- given us the benefit that we are human that's nice of her to say i didn't know that and then she's also brought in jesus christ <laughs> 
Uh, I disappointed God. Okay, cool. And I want to apologize. I think God doesn't accept apologies when it comes to racism. That's what I've heard anyway. Um, it's my future. And no one, one mistake should ruin it. Yeah, it should. It should do, isn't it? Like when people make mistakes, if somebody accidentally ran someone over and you, if you, if you accidentally run somebody over and they die and you know him, so like Caitlyn Jenner, you go to prison, right? That's what should happen, isn't it? But if you've got a bit of money and you know, you know the right judges, you might be able to get away with it, but you still have that, you know, um, mark on you that people know that you ran someone over and they died but you just don't go to prison so you you know you have to live with the fact that people know that you did it it's that OJ isn't it people know you did it but you know you, you didn't do it but if you're a regular civilian and you do something like that and you decide to kind of go over to your ex's house and bludgeon the ex and everyone else in sight with a knife so hard that the head's hanging off you you are probably going to go to prison that is what it is so if you make a gaffe online that is really egregious that rubs people the wrong way you just have to, that's the thing that i hate about the apologies i think the apologies are fine if you want to actually tell people that you're sorry but the apology in the hopes of trying to erase what you did so you can get your job back or get you know whatever it may be or, or so you could make sure that you don't lose out on your brand deals is really scummy because once you do the scumbaggy thing you should be scumbag enough to be like, you know what? I'm gonna sit in this. I know exactly what I said. If it's if it cost me this new, gig, if it cost me a presenting gig on ITV, I don't care because I want to tell everybody that I hate N words. Cool, do it. But then once your job goes away, don't then get on the internet and start crying and start apologizing and saying, oh, you made one mistake. Nah, you just you knew what you're doing. It didn't work out for you. Because imagine if you start, imagine the opposite happens. Imagine she starts a trend of loads of people online, social, loads of these 16 year old white girls on, Twitter, on TikTok deciding that, you know, oh, that's really funny to make these, you know, derogatory videos, you know, based on your color of your skin on anybody in the world, Asian, whatever it may be. Imagine that becomes a thing. Well, she didn't apologize, she probably wouldn't. So you only apologize because everything in your life that you hold dear has got pulled underneath your feet. And again, you said your dad is a rich person, get him to sort it out. Anyway, she says, um, I want to apologize. Please don't contact my college. Too late. It's my, especially if you mentioned it there, isn't it? The first thing someone's going to do is contact your college. <laughs> it's my future. And imagine what people are doing now. They're probably calling up a college, pretending they're fucking Fox News or some shit to add severity to it. Oh, what a mistake. It's my future and one mistake. No, it isn't really. If you did this once, you probably did other things and not ruin my life. Also, please stop with the death threats. Again, I apologize. Sincerely, Steph. Imagine saying that, right? And then being upset people are threatening to kill you. I wouldn't be worried about that. The last thing I'd be worried about is threatening to kill you. Like, that's what you're worried about? Really? You're on the internet. You're 16. Don't you know that's, just, that's part of the course? That's what it is, isn't it? That's like somebody's saying first on a comment underneath a video. It is what it is. Next screenshot. Um, she says, yeah, I promise to dedicate my life to serving God. <laughs> she didn't go to Jesus camp. No, what's that? Do you know they have that um, treatment that they supposedly have where they can uh, convert people from gay to straight, right? They don't have one for straight to gay, though, do they? Which is interesting. But um, they only have it for straight to gay, supposedly, right? They have these fucking conversion therapy camps that they go to. So what? Are they going to have these weird conversion camps that you're going to go to where they somehow make you like black people again? What? They're going to start playing, you know, Nelly's greatest hits and shit. And there's some old school Shanti records. And they're gonna show you clips of power when it was good, and then suddenly you're gonna like black people. Like, well, what? <laughs> um, I promise to dedicate my life to serving God and treating every human being with respect. <laughs> Thanks, darling. I do not expect the public to forgive me, nor do I deserve it. You probably won't get either of those things, but I pray God forgives my sins. <laughs> God has to do a lot in it. Imagine in this epic, in this pandemic, God's having to answer people's prayers in terms of us making sure they don't lose their jobs making sure they don't lose you know precious family members and then he's also got this fucking girl in georgia praying to god about you know please let these people not ruin my chance of getting to college because i decided to do n-word <laughs> hard r videos with my boyfriend in our toilet fuck me but i i wonder what the boyfriend says he's probably doubling down and he's probably got a full kkk outfit on and then two guns up right uh, but I pray God forgives my sins. That's the only way we heal. But I do take issue with one thing. Oh, okay. Let, let tell us, please. Hatred does not defeat hatred. Oh, the absolute, the absolute fucking balls on this girl to suddenly be telling, lecturing us about hatred, <laughs> mate. <laughs> let's run back the tape. What? Threatening, bullying, and cancelling me will not resolve the world's problems. Obviously not, but. 
this will obviously help me sleep better at night, right? Cancelling you, that would definitely help. Like, what? <laughs> Please, I urge everyone to seek God and find peace in Him. <laughs> and this- I think she's talking to herself, innit? I think she needs the peace, really. And we're peaceful, innit? Imagine if you called up the school and you got her cancelled. You're probably sleeping like a baby right now. You did your job. You are quiet as a lamb. And then this one is telling you she hopes that you have peace. <laughs> Doesn't she know the internet? People have people get their peace, get their satisfaction from tearing other people down. If you give them any inch. And you decide to do the one thing on the internet that no one likes, right? Let's be racist, right? That's the one thing no one likes, right? They don't tolerate homophobia and they don't t- <laughs> tolerate racism. Those two things that you cannot do online. Oh, and fuck around with pets. Fuck around with pets, you know, be uh, derogatory towards blacks. Uh, <laughs> say anything bad about trans, gay or queer or homosexual people. You get cancelled immediately. She did two of those things. Two of the three, right? <sighs> It's all one of the three, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's the poisonous three. You do one, you're out. Oh my god, and it's, I understand why people are angry at me, but how will ruining my life change that? It's not going to change anything, but it's going to be really satisfying. Uh, my parents live on fear for my life. That is not fair. What's <sighs> did I say? You know, she's young in it. Everything that you did is what led to your parents having fear in for their life. It's your fault, isn't it? That's why I respected Ari Shafir so much when he went on that tirade against Kobe and just like shut everything down. No pity party, yeah? That is all it is, isn't it? Like, you said your thing, you double down, it is what it is, you gotta live with that. So if, if he decides to walk down the street someday and everything opens up again and he just gets punched by some dude and he's knocked out, you just have to live with that. It is what it is. You can't start going from coming online and start saying, hey, we have to be conscious of each other and be safe and all this stuff. No, no, no. You came out talking reckless about somebody, you have to expect to get hit. Or to get some kind of retaliation And when it happens You just have to choke after the game Alright cool Shit hold my hands up It is what it is You can't start crying And telling And giving us lectures Start giving us life lessons We didn't do the thing You started it I'm just reacting to what you did um, Ruining my life Won't change that My parents live in fear Okay cool They live in fear We don't care And then the last one Screenshot is what For the love of God Stop sharing the video Of my name and picture It's too late my dear you do not know what it, this feels like. I've never been this scared. It just isn't fair. Imagine you're a stupid teenager just going along with stupid teenager stuff and then your life gets ruined. I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager, I don't think I ever was with somebody. I thought, you know, hey, let's play a game where we start <laughs> doing the N-word in unison and start making these fucking weird jokes. I don't know. I didn't have that kind of growing up. I don't have that kind of you know humor growing up, but, you know, maybe it's just me. It says get ruined forever. People not caring what's in your heart. Or oh, why would we care what's in your heart when we don't know you? Like, what are you talking about? Or oh, what you're likely like? What you're really like? Okay, only the de- only defining you by stupid video. Please stop sharing the video. It is too late. And I'm assuming, I assume for the most part that she's probably off Instagram as well, right? Let's see if we can find her. Is she off? Stephanie underscore Freeman. Is that how you spell it, right? Freeman. Is she on this deal or is it gone? I'm assuming it's gone, right? She's shut it down. It's not been shut down, it's still up. Okay, everything's been um purged. I'm sorry to any blacks that I got offended. Learn from my mistake. That's a weird one, isn't it? The way they say blacks is super bizarre. What's on the story? Is it still the same person we should be seen now? What is it? How is this anywhere okay? Just Someone told her to go and die, I guess. Okay, fair enough. But hey, what could you do? She's done in it. She's done for. She she learned a lesson, I think. And, you know, bloody hell, man. That is That gave me some laughs. Some good old belly laughs that did. Let's move on. Oh, the last dance documentary. Oh, that was a good one. Um, I'm sure some of you have already started watching it, but it is a really cool documentary available now on netflix called the last dance it follows the um the last season that michael jordan played for the chicago or the yeah, last season or was it the last season that phil jackson was there either way it was the season that they wanted to complete the triple the three the six 
an NBA championships in a row now. Again, I'm only talking to it from a point of view. I'm not a big NBA fan. Uh, I just see the clips here and around, but I'm not, I don't really follow anybody, don't know the rules, all that sort of shit. But I assume it was the documentary they filmed in the run up to them trying to complete uh, six championships in a row. And this is during, you know, Mike Jordan's heyday. Now coming it coming in, coming into it for as a no, as a non uh, NBA fan, but also knowing the the power of Michael Jordan and what he meant to that organization, the one thing that kind of stuck out to me was you know of course you know his greatness. I think that's something that you'd have to kind of you know there's another way that you can watch that and not be reminded of just how good this guy was, um, from the way that people talk about him to the way he's carries himself to just the way he plays right i think that's the one thing you notice about thing even even if you're not interested in the actual sport or in the you know in the field of creativity or arts you know if somebody's you know playing the cello or they're you know doing ballet or they're in a play or an actor on, on a big screen even if you're not a fan of those mediums right you can really you can notice when somebody is good at something that they're doing and when they're really bad or when they're just exceptional and just you know otherworldly you can see it even if you're not a fan i'm sure it's just, i remember doing this i remember that happening to me when i was a bit older and i used to like coach kids in like primary school and stuff and you start to know it straight i remember when we were younger we'd be like oh how come we didn't get trials for big teams and then you hear managers say oh we can spot talent from like you know the ages of like four upwards you'd be like no no way man I'm, i was sick i'm sick now i'm sick now but then when you start coaching younger kids especially kids under five years old you start to realize no you know why they can tell now because you can spot a kid that's like six years old right couldn't the way he controls a ball the way he uh the, this balance he has on it the way he runs his choice of passes the way he hits the ball instinctively it's just something you just can't teach it's just kind of you know god-given talent or god-given um kind of uh, uh orientation towards that certain thing um and it is it's just you have it or you don't have it so you can definitely see that when you watch the this last dance documentary on netflix you can just definitely see even if you're not a fan of the nba you can just see how good the guy is compared to everyone else he's up against and especially when you are a kind of casual fan of the nba like i am or you don't really you know i don't want to say casual just like you know whenever it's on you might watch it you can definitely notice the people he played with in this era you can see them next to each other and you can see how easily or how ordinary he's making them look and then you realize how good they are and you're like ah oh, now i get it it's like when you watch messi right it's all it's all well and good him skipping past you know some lowly team like salsa vigo or something or come to the burnabout um sorry come to a new camp and you're skipping past players you don't really have any context but then when Barca go and play a team that you are familiar with seeing play week in week out who are smashing your league to pieces right imagine if you're in a Premier League and Liverpool are beating everybody left right and centre 5-0 and suddenly you see Messi do the same thing he does to Celta Vigo to the Liverpool, Liverpool players like, okay cool now I get why he's so highly regarded and that's what happens watching this so you just realise how much of a you know demon he is in that regard you also see how much of a you know that winning mentality and that kind of competitive spirit is just it's just everything when it comes to true champions and i think that the good thing i liked about it was that you know jordan of course when he was at his pump he was it was away from social media it was away from having smartphones so there were rumors you did hear stories about him being a bit of a dick but for the most part we only had to concentrate on on the stuff he did in the court you didn't have to really care about his extra extra marital life the stuff he did outside of it his friends his connections what he might have got in trouble if you didn't really necessarily care because there wasn't enough context there wasn't enough juice in that story you know where the press going to get that information from who's really going to give a shit maybe those gossip sites weren't as big as they were nowadays right i'll, I'll say gossip sites are probably more bigger than maybe those gossip magazines from back in the day right they just you know people love to go on them just to even get because they're now the lands of blurred you know before a gossip site would just be like straight rumors and now it's like inf it's like news you know when someone wants to do a press release they'll send it out to a shade room or something and they'll also talk about what they might have heard on the scene so those things happen so i think because of that he was able just to concentrate on basketball and we were able just to concentrate on the stuff that he did on the court and he was able just to kind of deliver um especially just the mentality he had in the main stage of that clip of him playing against is it the boston celtics like fucking hell they still lost but he what, he puts up like 49 and then 62 points or some shit in the following game you're like god almighty man that guy was good and it was just the aggression the variety in his play it was just absolutely freakish to watch um 
I like the section that they focus on Scotty Pippen because I think he was somebody that a lot of people said was didn't didn't get the praise he deserved. That's a great thing I think about basketball, which is similar to what we're seeing now in football. Maybe because the prices and transfers have just gone sky high, we're seeing a lot of, especially in the Bundesliga, you see a lot of uh, football directors essentially building out the team or the squad. It would have particular goal what image in mind and then fitting the manager to that particular way of style of play right before it would just be like you get a manager in charge you give them a blank checkbook they sign who they want and then if that doesn't work you get someone else and they just rinse and repeat but then it ends up happening you end up ending up with the squad like united a few seasons back where you just end up with you know various players from different regimes who play different ways have different sort of skill sets different attributes it doesn't necessarily work but if you're able to have this continuity plan with, with or without the people at the top with, without maybe the manager or the coach it helps so basketball does that quite well while they you know they'll draft in a really big player someone really talented someone really mercurial and then they'll kind of put the pieces around that player in order to make sure they get the best of it out of him and it's the best for the team and I think that's what he, um, the guy, that Jerry Krause guy, who kind of comes out of it looking like a villain, to be honest. But he did really well in that regard. He was able to kind of recognize that they have this special one in a, once in a lifetime talent in Jordan and it just fit the pieces around him. And someone like Pippen got a lot of um, undeserved hate because he was injured, I guess, for most of the time. But um, he also was, the, I think uh, Jordan never says it, right? He's one of his best teammates ever. Um, you need that balance in the team. So that was really cool. Um, of course the Jerry Krause thing just goes to show that you know sometimes <laughs> pencil pushers and gatekeepers are usually the worst people aren't they really but I think part of it part of the reason why he suffered a lot and he got a lot of negativity towards him I think there's even one shot where they're coming to collect their championship medals and shit or their rings and everyone gets called out by the announcer and then once his name gets called out before the players everyone boos and as soon as it's Phil Jackson's name everyone cheers it's so you know that must have really got to him the fact that you know he knows that without him I think because no, I think Jordan came before he's he started his reign but he basically plucked Phil Jackson out from obscurity got the pieces in around Jordan you know the second season or the couple seasons after that to kind of make sure they were a championship winning team so he has every right to feel as if like he's an integral part of the organization but he tried to you know he was so you know maybe obsessed with his ego or so willing or so ready to get credit that he forgot that you know especially in sports man like people naturally have a bit of a hesitance to give any kind of organizational person you know person head office any kind of praise anyway really in it because they don't have the best reputation so when you try and go to war with one of the you know once in a lifetime talents like it just doesn't make any sense in it like i think he should have conceded defeat even if he wasn't defeated just earlier on just to get more out of it i don't understand the idea of like telling phil jackson oh no matter even if you win 82 games in a row you're gonna get sacked that is insane but it's same with football isn't it like they do it all the time but it's just such a weird thing like and especially because you're banking on it going right because it's good if you do that and then suddenly it still goes right and you suddenly somehow able to pluck another Jordan out from the woodworks and you're able to get another team to kind of go on another unprecedented run with another championship seventh right that's when it works but that is there's the probability of that working uh, is not high so he was banking on a lot for that to happen and of course it didn't happen in the end of the day um and then you know he passes away and everyone still thinks he's a villain right so he didn't necessarily get the praise he deserved in that regard but you know what can you do um and then again i just think it's inspiring to just see how highly what he was spoken about jordan that is from his uh peers and people that played with him i think the level of respect the fact that they were giving him his flowers and telling him he was otherworldly i think one person described him as a god you know that happened to be playing basketball right he wasn't human I think that really puts into context and really lets you understand why a lot of older folk who are around when who got to see Jordan play live whether it is in person or on TV and also got to see LeBron play live um, don't necessarily entertain the arguments of those guys being of LeBron being better it's just not a, a conversation I think everyone's willing to say hey LeBron's a better dude human right especially on the outside from what we know because I'm sure again I'm not too sure about being a better human when you're just showing us what you want to show us and stuff you know you never know I'm always of the thinking that people are a lot more dangerous than they let on I think people are a bit more malevolent than they want it to be known I think they can get away with more 
evil or naughty stuff, they would do it. So the fact that LeBron screams the whistle doesn't really say much. It's probably you know we we'll probably get more of you probably get a more fair accurate, accurate representation of his character based on what he done with the whole China stuff than you would do with how he treats his kids and you know the whole Tucker Tuesday stuff. But regardless, he obviously he's of course a better human being, right? Than Jordan, I think we can definitely agree on that. Um, but you'd be hard pressed to find anyone especially somebody that's not a Knicks fan or somebody you know who could you know a team that got demolished by Jordan every time they played but you'd be hard to find anyone that's gonna really say that LeBron's better and I think that is really testament to just how god level this guy has of playing the sport and again it just even whatever industry you're in it, it can't help but inspire you to just see this level of greatness to see how far he was able to take things it's just inspiring to see man and i like how they drop in at two episodes at a time per week on so on netflix i didn't know it was going to be on netflix i thought it was going to be something i had to kind of scrounge around on espn to find or get on a torrent but it's available now on netflix to watch i definitely recommend checking out even if you're not a fan of a basketball i think these documentaries especially the ones they do in the states of basketball and american football they have a really good way of kind of narrate of kind of st storytelling that even i think my mum would really like to watch it like do you know what i mean like they have a good way of doing it. i think some of the documentaries we get on football are very much geared at the person that you know sits in weather spins all day in fucking hula hoops isn't it but these documentaries are they appeal to anybody i think you can stumble upon it just watch it and it's a good life lessons to learn from it um the stuff about the 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 cocaine cowboys whatever they were or the crews that they had how they were known for getting on it and getting drunk and shit i'm not surprised i think we're going to probably hear a lot more of that down the line i'm not sure how much i buy the idea of jordan being 20 years old walking into a room and seeing you know people doing all sorts of manner of stuff and inside to walk back into his room and go away no it's not for me but it also could be true that could be a good origin story that could be a, a representation of who he is as a human that he was willing to sacrifice the early part of his career be clean as a whistle because now you know of course if you watch the tv if you actually, if you actually watch it there's a there's him sitting down talking to the camera and he's got a tall tall glass of fucking i think it's one of these pictures right he's got a tall tall glass of whiskey i think this is one of the go see so he's got that glass of whiskey it's full it's dark there's hardly any mixture in that he's got a cigar that he's talking very very freely so whoever did that in the show too was a good it's a good move that regard in it to get him to open up a bit but it was quite cool that he was able to sacrifice the early parts of his career especially when he was young to be the greatest in the world so that he can then enjoy the fruits of it later on he doesn't look the best now don't get me wrong he's got his eyes i don't know why they're all yellow and shit he's a bit bloated but he's a bigger he's an older dude now right you know and i'm assuming people at that height that kind of physicality the way he was pushing it to, to the limit it's going to take its toll on your body but i just i don't know man i just there's something admirable about that you know sacrificing you know all the vices that exist for young athletes in the early part of your career so that you could become you know the best that there ever was and you know now you know have many years on people are still talking about you in such glowing terms no one was willing to accept that somebody like a lebron james is even close to anywhere near you it's a really cool thing to see and i think for again any sport or any kind of field you're in you can't help but marvel at it and hope that you can replicate it in any kind of minuscule way that you can but i think and it's also the kind the really cool bit is that he wasn't necessarily regarded as somebody that was highly sought after in college that's what i didn't know i thought he was just like you know one of these um kind of uh god-given talents from when he was young it wasn't he had to work hard at being the way he was it was something that he kind of uh trained himself to be he kind of willed it into existence as opposed to just came out of the womb and he was shooting freeze um he wasn't an all-rounder that he of course he had parts of his game that was stellar but he wasn't the jordan that we know now when he was in college which is so awesome to see so practice makes perfect of course but definitely check it out if you haven't seen it the last dance is available now on netflix okay next on the list what else do we have here unfortunately we have another um festival that's been cancelled it's called the whole the whole was it the whole united queer ones if i can get the actual article up from resident advisor but this looks actually pretty actually there's got the statement under let me actually read the statement from i've put both of them up but yeah we had a lot of there's been a lot of casualties over this um pandemic i think a lot of people have, have finally come into the realization that um a lot of the stuff that they thought would happen in between times or to get it back to normal isn't going to happen and i'm assuming most of it is just due to the ongoing cost and there again like i said previously in the beginning of the show there's no guarantee that even if you put an event on people are going to come to it anyway so there's a lot of risk involved for these kind of events but the latest one to kind of bite the bullet 
is this festival called whole united queer festival which was in germany kind of really cool setting i remember always seeing the pictures around it's I don't know it's somewhere in the countryside in germany and they've got this amazing sort of platform that comes out that they people sort of dance on i remember always seeing those pictures around so that's pretty cool but yeah sad news regardless so this is a statement from this is a news from Maori actually it says germany's whole united queer festival has been cancelled in 2020 a statement today said organizers need 100,000 euros in order to keep the festival alive and are asking ticket buyers to consider donating a ticket they're also launching a crowdfunding campaign on friday and we'll update this campaign this is live so this is actual profile so you can see what they said but it's really sad man um i think to begin with anyways let me just put the whole thing up on here see if i can get it on the screen yep there you go so this is the actual thing itself so there's a following see if i can get it that's the third one let's see the first one was the first yeah first so dear whole community is with a heavy heart that we announced that this year's edition of whole festival is cancelled we are hoping that the current situation would improve but the recent news coming from uh whatever that place is where ferropolis is located restricts gatherings of over 1,000 people until the end of august again most of it's just logistics isn't it there's there's the dates obviously that you want to put your thing on because you want to take advantage of this of the weather but it's also the logistics of like having to postpone it because you're then postponing the setting up of it which is then going to still be within the window of it being cancelled anyway so maybe they they could potentially put the event on in september but you didn't have stuff to set up before then get things signed off it's just a whole horror show which i don't necessarily um envy but yeah shout out to them for trying uh with strong possibility of extension and strict social distancing measures. and this is germany too right so this is why it makes me think that the people that are w- wishing fucking not in your carnival happens are living in google land but it continues as uh, this is one of the hardest pills we've ever had to swallow but we accept at the and support the steps of being taken locally and abroad to flatten the COVID-19 curve. We consider postponing the dates to the festival 2021, but it's still too early to know if we'll be able to organize then and what the, it might look like. That's what I'm saying. So again, all these things being postponed to the new year, it's a little bit presumptuous, but I think the stuff like Junction has has hope because I think my personal opinion is that things go back to normal from the spring of next year. So that mean by, you know, February and stuff, everything will be cool. So that'll be fine. But postponing it straight away now, of course most of it's for liability reasons. They don't want to get, you know, sued by their insurer or by the festival owner, you know, for sorry, by the insurer. Um there's probably, you know, clauses and contracts and shit they have to kind of make sure they cover themselves with. But I think if you're if you've got a festival that you're looking forward to going to New Year, I would say you have to kind of ask yourself a question about supporting the festival itself and maybe not refunding if you want to make sure they stay alive. One thing, and you also have to come to realization or accept the fact that it probably might not happen, regardless if it's the New Year. It's just one of those things, and it continues here. Um, let's see the nice next one. The number two image where is it oh no 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 one two the decision comes at a step steep cost to us as it's a new festival we've carried a major debts for our initial developing years none of none of the previous editions have broken even which is really sad and really heartbreaking to see but there has to be a conversation around that right like i get doing it for the love and if you see actually let me get the after movie up on here because i think that after movie was fucking gorgeous let's see if i can find it They've got a really, really cool, um, is it whole after movie? Yep, there we go. From 2019, right? And it's really fucking cool. I'll play a little bit of it for you now to see. But I'll play the screen. Boom. Whoops, let's go back to the beginning. tents out there with loads of cool installations people dressed up amazing really making the effort it's great the setting the place I call home. great backdrop this cool soundtrack the that's, the, that's the image i remember seeing of people just like on this little uh, floating little thing that goes out to the water but imagine putting an event like this right going to this length just so you could put it on for the sake of it that's that's what i mean about the beauty of the dance music industry or the community or the culture in general there's people putting on events like this you know have safe space for people who identify as queer or who in that whole scene to put this event on just so they can have it on not not to make any money at all and the last editions you know they said quite clearly in the statement right um 
they haven't broken even on any of the events not one not two none of them are broken even they've been making them at a loss just to put them on it's fucking insane how cool that is man like honestly man it's just i get it from just a, a selfish point of view if i'm a fan of dance music and i want to put on a festival and i'm fed up because i think that's the thing that's really cool about this sort of stuff if you're fed up with sitting around in a smoking area you know complaining about the landscape of the club scene you should put, do something right follow mark and Jason's advice and build something yourself and not criticize other people doing what they're doing but there's a, a real big there's a real big gap between that and also putting on something just for the sake of it like just just to do it for, because you want to have something there something that exists that you know fills that void that you need it's insanely cool Dreamers. Dreamers. so yeah a festival like this should be making some sort of mind so i think my point in this is like as as you know sad as it is there needs to be a conversation had with some organizers and promoters about and especially maybe some fan i don't know maybe fans is not a good uh, term people that buy tickets ticket holders there has to be a conversation around like how you go how you support people that actually are you know trying to make some positive change in a scene that are trying to create safe spaces what you know are there grants available all those things you know because there's no way this event should be happening from you know the love of someone's heart from their own pocket at a loss every year and then once one event gets pulled off like they're completely ruined as a brand that shouldn't be on in it we should be able to support these kind of people doing these sort of things because you know this is imagine this is your first experience of a safe space and you flew in from another country and now you're hearing this news right how close to your heart does this festival um what how much does this mean to you right and now it's going away because you know the scene doesn't this people are more willing to go to these big ticket events these crappy warehouse events that you know are sponsored by you know uh, you know squarely corporate character than to poor people are actually doing things on a ground level but it continues um our lack of financial reserves made the current situation impossible for us to face our own which is really bad as well i think we've really realized now that this era especially at myself anyway i've realized how important cash is cash is king having the ability to dip into some kind of amount of savings or some little bit of money that you saved over is really helpful in a situation where you don't know where your next check's going to come from so i think for clubs and festivals especially that you know have the ability to have you know reoccurring amount of ticket sales um you know depending on what season there has to be some kind of this is why some pl most places should be adopting a residence lineup only you shouldn't be flying in fucking you know I don't know if Ricardo, to try, Ricardo Villalobos to play your stupid little wine bar in Brick Lane. You don't need that, right? It needs just the local community to come out, fill it up and give it a good scene. Give give, give an opportunity to somebody coming up to do do their thing. So you grow and you build together um, as opposed to spending all your budget on Ricardo coming down. He's not going to move the needle. No one's going to come back again the next week when he's not playing. I never understood why these guys do this. So there has to be a conversation with those clubs and these events to be like, hey, you know give the time and the space to people that are local so that you can reduce your overall fees because those people coming up they don't want to you know they don't they don't care about making 10 grand per gig in the beginning they just want to be able to play for a receptive audience so you get a chance to kind of cover your nut and have a whole array of people playing for way less than paying two or three people um that needs to happen going forward um and then then you can start saving money and putting that into because that needs to happen too because again you're not sure sure what licensing laws are going to spring up who's going to come into power and have different points of view have more view dance music culture differently you have to kind of have those things in mind it says again um, we've pulled off this little piece of paradise with no corporate backing which is really commendable or spon major sponsorship support which again i think is commendable but there could be some leeway where you again you don't you, you get sponsorship from brands and companies that actually are aligned with your values that could be good as well so just to help to alleviate the cost i don't think there's anything wrong with taking money from corporate organizations and feeding it back into what you do i think it's wrong when you just completely sell out right and you have fucking coca-cola plus all over you in the building and it has nothing to do with the culture you're representing but i don't think anyone would be against them making some money do you know what i mean or making sure that it's self-sufficient at least um uh because then if it's self-sufficient and you, you go into this kind of position you can then rely on the community coming together to find us the next one that would be really cool um which wants to support everything we do is funded by ticket sales everything that whole is is thanks to you and it continues here i think this is where they ask people to not to refund a machine which is really difficult nowadays people are just 
her in his wealth of money but it says even without hosting this year's event we have already incurred production costs that can't be recovered we also want to pay our team of members and local Berlin collectives who have worked hard all year in preparation for the festival who have lost all work for in the read into me into into indetermined indeterminate sorry period of time our festival insurance does not cover pandemics and help from the government has so far been very limited closely insignificant considering our particular situation we realize the landscape is currently flooded with many pleas for funding but the hard reality is we need to raise a hundred thousand to keep the whole alive we need your help so again if you've got anything from them definitely support those guys um, this Friday, April 14th, we'll send out an email to everyone that has already purchased tickets. We'll contain an refund form. This also explain how you can make a solidary donation should you be in a position to donate. Even a small percentage of your ticket will be a great help for us. A major act of solidarity with the whole community is the only thing that will ensure the survival of Hull in these uncertain times. This Friday, we will also launch a crowdfunding campaign for those who of you that have yet to purchase a ticket but would like to join the effort to keep a queer utopia alive last one like you we long to dance side by side to sunshine by the treehouse bathe the naked at the beach or make love with new friends in the old tents but all that must wait soon we will re revel again and underneath the cranes together united as one this is a time for deep self exploration while also to test the strength of our chosen families birdless communities Please reach out to one another and, sh and share love, time, and resources. Love the whole team. So, yeah, um, thoughts and feelings go out to those guys. Hopefully, you can support them if you're in a position to. And again, like I said, I hope there's a conversation further around, you know, the idea of how we kind of make sure these clubs don't get in a position where suddenly if the doors close, they're, you know, going under, or we get in a position where some of them have some sort of cash reserves, you know, government funding, sponsorship that's able to kind of support them during the tough times, not just only when, you know, people have their hands in the air and they're shaking out, we don't care. We need to have that support because, you know, the last thing you need is for these sort of, like, independent festival organizers who are actually doing the, you know, the good work or God's work, let's say, um, being left out in the lurch with no possible future coming and then have the corporate people still alive you know what i mean that's not what you want you want these the companies to stay alive more so but um hopefully things work out anyway that's an hour of the show thanks so much for tuning in as per usual um if you want to learn more about myself visit my site which is down below it's .com. links all my social media and stuff is on there if you are live watching this via youtube of course make sure you subscribe make sure you hit that like button make sure you leave me a comment that would be nice and if you're listening via the podcast app of course leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends and family but until then take care peace